Um, oh, this is so nice. Um, forgive me the throat. Um, I, I'm just sort of getting out of um, um, a horrible kind of fluey condition, which I'll try not to give to you. I'm standing, sitting as far back as I possibly can. Um, but if any of you, during the middle of my remarks, suddenly get up and throw up, I won't take it personally. It's just you've contracted whatever it was I had. Um, so this is, this is fantastic. It looks like you know, the nicest college there ever was. So there will actually be an exam before you leave the room, OK? So I don't want to hear any kind of snoring, or uh, at least no, no audible snoring going on. So here's this um, funny book I, I wrote called Rough Crossings, and, um, which I expect, since it was only published yesterday, not all of you will have read from cover to cover yet. It's quite a long book, although it was said. You will not find, particularly in your standard social studies high school textbook, or am I wrong? You know, did you all know that the first women to vote for anything anywhere in the world were runaway slaves freed by the British who made it in the end all the way back to Africa as free blacks and voted in local government elections in Sierra Leone. Do, you know, does it appear in social studies textbooks that the first um, articulate African-American political leaders essentially are those who fought in the British Army or were aligned with the British during the Revolutionary War and after? The first free black churches, the first free black schools, all a part of this extraordinary experience, this enormous exodus. In the African-American experience and black American experience, the first free black schools, the first free black churches, the first black ministers to baptize whites, the first votes, the first, who, the first time any woman in the history of the world votes for anything are the escaped slaves, women slaves who go to the British end up in Sierra Leone in Freetown and are householders and vote in the elections for eight years in local government. Sarah, it's a kind of crucible in which the modern black American experience is formed, but of course it's formed in these exiles as a result of the defeat. Some of the early Sierra Leoneans, mm -hmm. uh, like Wallace Johnson, for mm -hmm. instance, did you ever have contact with him? I had contact with him, but uh, he was a little more radical than Sam Milton and I liked. Yeah, because again he had his contact with uh, Ghana and always the, with the Gold Coast in those days and their contacts were always suspected. They were supported by the Communist Party in England yeah. for some reason or other. So, so that he was not... Uh, but as a person he was a wonderfully nice person. And then uh, what his other people... But Bankoli Bright who was the Creole leader, he we did not like at all. Because he looked down on Samitin Maga, that, that made the doctor. You see, so ah. we did not like him. And this is where the, that's where Madame Koblo and her husband come into the picture. Before I went even to Nigeria, but while I was already uh, starting the SOS, uh, by Koblo, who, who became the husband of uh, Ella Koblo, uh, Ella Koblo, he would come from Freetown at the meeting of Leg Legislative Council to me because we were related in a way, coming from the same part of the country. And he said, do you have, you help me a little bit. Then Creole, they are bought me too much, Bankoli Bright and Bill Kumbelstam. He said, write one speech for me. So since they had started calling him those backward people over there, he said, let's, let's put them in their place. So I wrote a speech to him in which he said, you people must remember that after all, you are guests in this country. We, we, we took you when you came from slavery. <laughs> and they did not like that, you see, that we put the word slavery there. And they said, that made him and they call slave. At the meeting of the Protected Assembly, which Somna and, and uh, Anthony and I attended, where we formed SOS, his mission was to get the chiefs of country to accept a, a, a land tenure bill which the British wanted passed, which they knew that would not be acceptable normally from the British because land tenure system in the country and which the Creoles would like very much because the Creoles would like to go up country and buy land which they cannot do now. So his mission was to get the chiefs to accept this idea that land tenure system of Great Britain would be spread throughout the whole protectorate. As soon as we got word of this, we called the chiefs together and said, ah, we've heard that something they want you to pass at the next meeting. Do, please don't agree. 
And the reasons of this is we don't have land tenure the way the Creoles and the British have it of country. Of country, you know, the land belongs to the people, but in the name of the chief. If you come and want land, you go and beg for it from the chief, he would say, yes, here's this place, you can build a house there, you can farm, etc. But it's not yours. You cannot sell it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. When you go away, it belongs to Bakaron. And that's the system we want to keep. And the chief said, yes, we understand that. Just check this. Okay. And of course, we had for we call it French who were Creoles. Did you know the story that some, between Sir Milton and I, there were no other protected people ever in Frobe, in Frobe College. No. He was the first and only protected person admitted to the to Frobe College and got a degree. And between him and me, which was, I mean, he was there when I was born, so to speak, 1915. Oh, yeah. And I, nobody else. So that that long league, and the Creoles had kept that as their own. We won't let these bush people come, come and corrupt us. But when I went there and made friends with the 